Good afternoon. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's really an honor. I would like to start by sharing with you the story of four blood brothers, all born and raised at the foothills of the longest mountain range of the Philippines, the Sierra Madre. The parents of the blood brothers are farmers. They're both elementary school dropouts. The father only finished sixth grade and the mother third grade. I want to tell you about blood brother number one first. Blood brother number one, grade school for him went very smoothly, but when he got to high school, he got into bad company. He drank, he smoked, he skipped classes. And you see, because he skipped classes, by the time he reached third year, the school kicked him out. He detested farming, though his parents were farmers, because he believed that it never improved their life. He became a construction worker, a truck helper, then a rugs maker. Later on, however, blood brother number one got sucked into illegal logging as a form of, uh, as, as a source of income. When he was 25 years old, he was accused of murder. The police came. He was handcuffed, dragged into the police car, and thrown into prison. No trials, no nothing. Two years later, he was released and life continues to be a hand-to-mouth existence. He is now 38 years old and a father of two. Now, blood brother number two. Blood brother number two never liked to study. Even as a young kid, his parents had to plead with him to attend classes each day. As a punishment, therefore, his parents made him work at the farm, hoping that he would realize how difficult life could be without education. He had to wake up very early in the morning. He planted, he harvested, he cleaned, and he helped sell their family's produce at the marketplace. When he realized that he could make money from selling vegetables, all the more, he lost interest in studying. He dropped out of school even before he finished fifth grade. Soon, farming Planting and selling vegetables lost its charm. And so he became a construction worker, just like his older brother, a rags maker, a trucking assistant. But later on, he succumbed to illegal logging and charcoal making, earning but a dollar a day while destroying our environment. One day, his mother was diagnosed to have serious complications of urinary tract stones, diabetes, and high blood pressure really wanting to help, blood brother number two, at age 17, moved to Manila and worked as a garbage collector. He was so enticed to try it because the other young men in his community thought that it was more lucrative than illegal logging and charcoal making. One year later, he came back to the same grind. He is now 23 years old, has a live-in partner and a two-year-old son. Now, blood brother number three was a double whammy. He never liked to study. He would always get in trouble. And he would always skip classes. When he reached first year high school, he joined a gang. He would always get detained, and his name was frequently on the police blotters. When he reached second year high school, he finally dropped out. For his parents, it was the end of constant embarrassment in the school community, but, as, but it was only the beginning of endless arguments at home. Blood brother number three, because of his reputation, couldn't find any jobs. And so he, he also hated farming. And as a result, he became a good-for-nothing who slept during the day and hanged out with his friends at night. Soon, he began stealing money from his mother's purse gambling, smoking weed, using meth. Many times he came home late, drunk, and under the influence of drugs. And whenever his father would reprimand him for his obnoxious behavior, 
and his laziness, he would answer back, dash out of the house, and be gone for days. One time, their family received a phone call. It was his girlfriend. She was sobbing heavily as she broke the news. Blood brother number three had attempted suicide. Fortunately for him, his girlfriend stood by him despite the challenges, despite everything. And this brought stability into his life. They are now, the girlfriend is now his living partner and they have three children and an adopted son. Blood brother number four, the seventh out of nine kids, witnessed all of the problems of his older brothers growing up. He would always be terrified whenever he learned that his brother was picked up by the police, got into a fight, or attempted suicide. Every single day he wondered, when will I drop out next? Will I be able to continue with my schooling? Will we have anything to eat today? In fifth grade, blood brother number four had an English teacher who was very passionate about teaching, and she emphasized to her students that poverty should never be a hindrance in fulfilling one's dreams. These words were etched into the soul of blood brother number four, and it became his conviction that education is key to escaping the clutches of poverty. One day, his mother heard about a foundation that was established in their neck of the woods. It's called Green Earth Heritage Foundation. They were restoring the forests, providing livelihoods in organic agriculture, and they were teaching farmers' kids to live, hope, and dream. It's a holistic organization, and so they have a child sponsorship program wherein they connect farmers' kids with donors who would then give modest monthly monetary support to help the kids with their school essentials. As you all know, public school is free, but everything else is not. So at this point, this was the only thing new that would bring hope. So blood brother number four, accompanied by his mother and his two younger brothers, walked four hours round trip across a bridgeless river, unpaved roads, slopey terrains, under the searing heat of the sun. He wanted to apply for the child sponsorship program. That's why he did that. After the, the foundation accepted his application, and after 30 days, he was connected to a donor. But Green Earth believes that in the Bible, in the biblical teaching, that to whom much is given, much is required. Every sponsored child was required to attend the English and computer literacy classes as well as the Bible-based values formation sessions every weekend and every day during the summer. Definitely not an easy deal. Blood brother number four had to walk four hours round trip. He would leave his house very early in the morning, always in an empty stomach, and he would get home very late at night. There was a time when he nearly drowned crossing the river when it rained so heavily all of a sudden but he still crossed because he just wanted to get home. As he laid on the bank of the river, he said to himself, enough is enough. This is it, time to quit. But you know, as he lay there, he came to his senses and realized that if he did quit, he may not drown in the river, but he would drown in grinding poverty forever and ever. And so he resolved in his mind that he would not give up. He renewed his mind. After a year of attending the literacy at Green Earth, diligently, the leadership noticed his dedication. He was outpacing the other farmer's kids in terms of English. And so he was assisted to compete for the five-year scholarship offered by the International School Manila. In 2012, blood brother number four became the first farmer's child to win the International School Manila Scholarship in its 92-year history. You see, five years later, blood brother number four won four full-ride scholarships abroad from Dartmouth, Harvard, NYU Abu Dhabi, and Wesleyan. 
he decided to go to Harvard and he's actually starting this fall. Blood brother number four embarked on a different journey in life. And it all started by transforming his mind, by the renewing of his mind. He thought that this would not, never happen to him. But because he renewed, he, he resolved at age of seven to not to become like his older brothers. And at the age of 12, listen to his public school teacher who constantly reminded him that poverty should never be a hindrance in fulfilling one's dreams. This happened to him. You see, my friends, to set one's mind on a goal is just the beginning. But in the journey ahead, it's long and it's difficult. It requires passion, perseverance. It requires faith, most importantly. Not in oneself, but in God. Blood brother number four, he, he trusted in the Lord with all his heart. He leaned not on his own understanding. In all his ways, he acknowledged him, and he directed his paths. Transformation is the process of profound and radical change which orients an individual into a completely different place or direction, taking itself into an entirely different level of effectiveness and progress. Transformation is not just about being oriented in one in a different place. Transformation is about being an effective individual, one that is relevant, one that is purpose-driven. In a book called The Oxford Group and the World Crisis, Herman Hagedorn, the author, he talks about the 6,000 people in Switzerland who have been transformed and as a result began paying their income tax one day before the Geneva meeting began, an unprecedented event. In Canada, a newspaper publisher pays the government $12,000 in payment of the custom duties he once evaded. In Great Britain, a team of over 100 students from Cambridge and Oxford spent their Christmas vacation in East End London, living with the unemployed, and began to see them changed by love. In Holland, an engineer smashed by depression Invent a, invents a new kind of explosive bomb, and three countries clamored for the patent. But he was transformed. He tore the formula. These examples embody true transformation. Transformation is not just about a change in appearance, your traits, or your beliefs. Transformation is about becoming an effective individual. Ever since the fourth blood brother graduated in May of 2017, he has been traveling around the country, offering a message of hope and inspiration to rural public school students and idle teenagers. He does this because he believes that it only takes one person to inspire another, just as he has been inspired by his public school teacher, whose words constantly ring in his ears. Poverty should never be a hindrance in fulfilling one's dreams. While on his pre-Harvard gap year, he has been invited to speak in uh, different, in various provinces numerous times. In addition to that, he is helping mentor undereducated uh, urban citizens coming to his foundation looking for jobs. He is taking part in every step of the tree planting initiative of his supporting foundation from the collection of seedlings and uh, seeds to propagation to planting. He is using every opportunity he has to be a beneficial and an effective member of our society. He is using every opportunity he has as, a par as part of his continuing process of transformation. Transformation is not just a one-time event. It is a continuous process that goes on through life. Now you may ask, how do we become transformed? I searched exhaustively and because I wanted to find the best answer to this question. But you know what? For me, I got the, the answer from the Bible. It said, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How then can we renew our mind? Well, fix your thoughts on what is true, 
what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Dwell on these things. Thank you very much.